In the first video, we established why we should care what Muslims believe. Simply put, it is a matter of life and death. Muslims believe that it is okay to tell us that Islam is a religion of peace, when in fact it has resulted in the deaths of 10 million Buddhists, 60 million Christians, 80 million Hindus, and over 120 million Africans. To lie on behalf of such a murderous doctrine is to aid and abet the terrorists that continue the legacy today. This is my thesis. It's time for me to prove it. After all, if Islam were really as bad as I'm making it seem, every Muslim man, woman, and child would be a terrorist. Fortunately, most Muslims do not follow Muhammad's example and prefer peace to fighting. Unfortunately, most Muslims don't know their own scriptures and thus protest Islam's guilt when the ones who do read it wage jihad. Since we covered the Quran explanation in the last video, you know that the Quran is an unsynchronized mess and impossible to understand without a lot of time, patience, and willpower. I'm going to spare you all that and just summarize it here as a guy who's read the whole damn thing and knows what he's talking about. After that, I'll summarize the history of Muhammad's life. Here we go. I slash we, Allah, am slash are the only God there is. I am the same God as that of the Jews and Christians. The Jews used to be Muslims, aka those who submit to me, but they all massively conspired to rewrite their history and now they're all liars. Jesus was also a Muslim, and all of the Judeo-Christians are liars too. My holy place is the wasteland of Mecca. Everyone must come and worship me there. Those who aren't Muslims will be thrown in hell. Those who aren't Muslims will be thrown in hell. Those who aren't Muslims will be thrown in hell. My followers must go and make everyone else Muslims and fight and subdue everyone who resists. Those who do not fight will be punished and replaced. Believe in me, pay me, and fight for me. Muhammad is my one and only prophet and you must obey us, but since I never speak to anyone but him, you really must obey him. He's not crazy. He's not crazy. He's not crazy. He gets one-fifth of any war booty you take in battle, and he's exempt from the situational rules he gives to the rest of you. Honor him and love him more than your family, your wealth, and your possessions. I am all forgiving, most merciful, but I will never forgive the transgressors. Kill them. Anyone who opposes me and my messenger will have a humiliating punishment, which I describe in great detail. Anyone who obeys Muhammad will be rewarded in a paradise designed for men only, in which their most carnal cravings for food, wine, and sex will be satisfied. Sounds bad, doesn't it? Well, I'm not presenting anything incorrectly. There's a reason that the Islamic nations are the least free, least educated, least civil, most impoverished, most dangerous, and most oppressive places on earth. I am ready and able to quote Quran verses and Muslim historical sources to back up anything I said in the summary. However, let's first do that abridged Islamic history and biography of Muhammad's life. It's longer than the Quran summary, but it should also be more revealing of Islam. Here we go. Allah created everything in several conflicting creation accounts. He made man out of a blood clot. Uh, no, stinking clay. No, a drop of sperm. Uh, whatever. The point is, man was created. Satan deceived man into disobeying Allah, and since then, many men have disbelieved. According to Muhammad, Allah sent prophets to various nations who acted just like Muhammad. They told people to submit to Allah. The people teased them, so the prophets teased back. Then Allah destroyed the people. Muslim prophets ranged from the polytheistic Alexander the Great to the self-promoted Son of God, Jesus. But they were really Muslims. Anyone who says otherwise is a hell-bound disbeliever. Muhammad was born in Mecca, but had a rotten childhood because his father soon died and his mother abandoned him to a wet nurse. In his insecurity, he later married a woman old enough to be his mother. Muhammad spent much of his time in caves, observing the pagan rites of Mecca until he encountered a spirit one night. The spirit, who claimed to be Gabriel from the Bible, beat Muhammad up, then told him to warn the Meccans about Allah. Muhammad felt like he'd been demon-possessed and attempted suicide multiple times, but he never followed through. He ended up accepting his prophetic role after much urging from his wife, but in the first 10 years of his life, he only converted about 15 Meccans to submission. The other Meccans wanted a sign from him to prove he was a prophet, and when he couldn't perform one, they ridiculed him and accused him of plagiarism. In response, Muhammad mocked them back, cursed their gods, derided their parents, and threatened to slaughter them. 
As tensions mounted, the dozen Muslims would lash out at the Meccans, and the Meccans would persecute the Muslims in an attempt to make them drop Islam. Muhammad, however, remained safely under the protection of his uncle. Then one day, things changed forever during an Arab pilgrimage. As neighboring clans were visiting their idol gods in Mecca, Muhammad went around trying to convince them that he was a prophet. He met rejection with everyone until he came across a group from the distant settlement of Medina. See, these guys were living next to some local Jews at the time, and they would occasionally raid them. The Jews would tell them that their Messiah was coming, and that they would have their vengeance. Thus, when the Medina Arabs saw Muhammad, they mistook him for the Jewish Messiah. To thwart the Jews, they accepted him as a prophet, and Muhammad finally had himself an armed force. Allah then conveniently gave Muslims permission to fight, and they quietly declared war against all non-Muslims. When the Meccans realized what was happening, they attempted to assassinate Muhammad, but the prophet used his cousin as a decoy and escaped to Medina. The rest of the Muslims went with him. From that point on, the war of words turned to swords. Muhammad needed money and weapons to fund his campaign, so the first Muslims went on raiding expeditions, robbing Meccan trade caravans. The first 10 raids were complete failures, but eventually the Muslims had some success. When they weren't stealing from the Meccans, they were attacking and robbing their Jewish neighbors under the excuse that the Jews had rejected Muhammad as a prophet when he called them to Islam. They were besieged, starved into, sub into submission, and then banished from their homes. Eventually, the Jews went to the Meccans for help, and all the victims of Muhammad's terrorist raids came together and marched to Medina. They nearly defeated the Muslims there, but gave up when the weather conditions became too bitter. Muhammad then turned on the remnant of the Medina Jews and slaughtered all the men. His fighters raped the women and sold the children into slavery. At this point, Muhammad had accumulated enough arms, horses, and mercenaries to attack Mecca. As he promised, he slaughtered anyone who had made one last defensive stand. Then when his forces had taken control of the city, he further assassinated certain people who teased him back before he controlled an army. Having taken his revenge, Muhammad spent the last couple of years of his life continuing his attacks on any settlements who rejected Islam. Those who surrendered were taxed, and those who didn't were conquered and plundered. By the time of Muhammad's death, he'd instigated 75 terrorist raids in 8 years. When Muhammad died, his closest companions continued the battles, spreading Islam from Spain to India by the sword. They promised Muslims what Muhammad had promised them, war booty if they lived, and virgins in paradise if they died as martyrs. The promise remains to this day. So there you have it. I've made none of this up. You can find the whole history on prophetofdoom.net, quoted word for word from Islam's own historians. What do you think? Even if this is the first time you're hearing this, considering the state of the Middle East, does this seem about right? We're out of time, but I'm going to end the video with a few quotes from the Quran. Now that you know what Islam is really like, you will know that these quotes are not out of context. They say exactly what they appear to. Quran 839 Fight until all religion is for Allah alone. Quran 2 verse 216 Jihad is ordained to all Muslims even if they dislike it. Quran 8 verse 12 Allah will terrorize the unbelievers, cut off their heads and their fingers and toes. Quran 9 verse 29 Fight the unbelievers until they are humbled and pay the religious tax. Quran 9 verse 38 Believers must fight or be punished and replaced. Quran 9 verse 111 Allah's cause equals killing infidels and getting killed.